Welcome to Chosen Chapter 2, covering a contemporary issue. Chosen Chapter 2, Chapter 2, covering a contemporary issue. Uh, the contemporary issue I'm trying to cover today is the uh, persecution of Christians in Manipur. Uh, the exact thing, what happened there on the other side of eternity, we will know, but we understand that Christians of Manipur who were living in their homes were evacuated and they had to flee. The churches they worshipped in was uh, were destroyed. The, some of the houses were destroyed and they are in acute pain. All that they lost, all that they had, they lost. And this is not only happening to Christians in Manipur, but we know that across the world, people who follow Jesus Christ have been given, uh, have been treated this way. Not just that, uh, I can give you another contemporary scenario. You are enjoying good health and all of a sudden your health goes. Uh, another scenario, you are having a good family relationship and all of a sudden, you know, you've, your family relationships have broken down and you're now all alone and you've lost everything. Maybe you had a job, uh, that is another, another scenario. You had a cool job, well-paying job. Suddenly you are laid off and you've lost everything. It could be any of these scenarios or scenarios like this. What would the word of God say to you? Turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 30. My purpose is not to uh, give a detailed teaching on this chapter, but I'm going to make this very brief as possible. Uh, I want to read from the voice version, which is the best contemporary English version, according to me, uh, which is also safe. It says, when David and his men reached Ziklag three days later, they discovered that the Amalekites had raided the desert hill country. David was on a run, and in this context, uh, especially and he is going from place to place, already he's in trouble, and more trouble coming in because the Amalekites had raided, his, raided the desert hill country. They attacked Ziklag David, in David's absence and burnt it. So they attacked David's family who were in Ziklag in David's absence. They burnt it, okay? And they carried away the women and all the inhabitants whom David had left behind. None of them were killed, but they were all taken captive and were and carried back towards Amalek. So entire David family, women, kids, carried away and the Whatever they had, the, the, the shelter they had, maybe not a own house, but a temporary shelter, was burnt down. Um, thank God they did not uh, uh, kill David's family members. I will come to that in a moment. And then verse 3, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 3. And David and his men arrived, uh, and his, David and his men arrived in the burnt city and found their wives, daughters, sons gone. So wives gone, daughters gone, wives, plural, I'll come to that. Daughters gone, daughters gone, sons gone, taken captive by the Amalekite raiders. And when they saw this, and verse 5, verse 4 is so close to our heart. Verse Samuel 30, verse 4. When they saw this, they cried out and wept aloud until they could weep no more. Maybe there was a there isn't the occasion in your life after this particular painful incident, maybe persecution because of the enemies of the gospel, a loss of job, a family strife, a, uh, the diagnosis of a disease to a close one. And when you heard that news or, uh, you know, after that pain, you cried until you had no more strength to cry. And you are listening to, the, to this broadcast right now. From wherever you are in the world, you're in a situation where you cried so much and you have no longer strength to cry. And to you this morning, the word of God comes. And that's what David and his men did. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 4. David's wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nahal, were among those carried off. 
uh, verse 6, David too was in anguish. Some of his men talked about stoning him because they were so bitter about their families being taken. You know, as David ran first from Saul and then later from Absalom, a group of men gathered around him. David was a charismatic man. He was a, he was a great leader. He attracted people around him. Uh, despite his flaws, his charisma remained. And some of these guys think of stoning him, verse 6. Already on the run because his son is against him. Now his house, the rented house or temporary shelter burned down. Wives gone, children gone. And on top of that, his own men think of stoning him. Maybe you're in that situation. You not only lost your job, but you also lost your health. Not only lost your health, but you also lost your house. Trouble one after the other. David has been in your situation. He under, he would understand. You know, God of David would understand. He understands the situation that you're in right now. And then, so when you're in such a situation, what should be your response? First response, and I'm going to give you a D series, drench. First response is drench. First Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6, the second part. But David took comfort in the eternal one is true God. In other words, uh, the NI, this is uh, the wise version on this side and the NIV on this side, it says, uh, but David found strength in his Lord. David found strength in his Lord. Or David drenched himself in the presence of God. So when all of these crazy things happen, uh, you might be in a, in, a, in a refugee camp in Manipur, I don't know, or you might be in a hospital somewhere but that cannot stop you from finding strength in your Lord or drenching yourself in God's presence. Um, you can say to the Lord, Lord, they have taken away my property. They have taken away my family. Lord, my health is gone. My, my strength is gone. My strength is gone, but that, was not, that will not stop me from receiving spiritual strength from your presence. So I'm going to drench myself in God's presence. So sufferings should not remove you from God's presence. Suffering should not make you doubt the existence of God. Rather, suffering should bring you close to God. There are Bible characters, after Bible characters, who got close to God thanks to suffering. Job also came close to God thanks to his suffering. Job had questions, but he never abandoned God. He was always talking to God, debating with God. So don't abandon God during your suffering. Come close to him. Wrench yourself in, pres in his presence and you will find that you are receiving strength. I can say that, you know, when I my US visa was rejected several years ago, over a decade ago, when I was driving back home, I found strength in the Lord. When I, when I was rejected in the final, after the final interview in Google, after clearing so many stages, difficult stages. In the final stage, the HR on, as they call it, when I was, when I was rejected, uh, you know, these are the three day, three, four years, I, three years I worked uh, to start G formation as a tent making missionary, like Apostle Paul, uh, uh, you know, of, uh, did, you know, he worked in certain cities and raised support and then did the ministry. So there was a phase in my life and I worked and I have, there was an opportunity for me to work with Google, the original Google. I'm talking about the Google, the great company. The last stage, I was, it was when my, and I was rejected. I felt so, so sad, but I found strength in my Lord. I drenched myself in God's presence. So that's the first thing. And then look at verse seven. David called for the priest Abiata, the son of Ahimelech, and instructed him to bring the priestly vest, which he did. And David, uh, to the Lord, David said to the Lord, should we pursue these raiders? Can we catch them? So David inquired of the Lord. What's the second thing that you do in a similar situation? Not only drench, but also direction, receive it from the Lord. Direction, receive it from the Lord. Ask specifically what you should do. Here, David had to personally uh, he took the help of Abiyatha, the priest, but you can go directly to God. Of course, it also will help you to confide in a few people around you, church believers, long-lasting friends, and tell them what you're going through. Don't be a loner this time. And together, you know, you pray, you ask your friends to pray for you, but you receive direction from the Lord. In fact, 
a cursory googling how many times David inquired of the Lord. If you Google how many times David inquired of the Lord, you'd find that he inquired of the Lord nine times in his life. Nine times. That is his habit. Now, these days, we've there are there are an increasing gang of people who do what they want to do, do what the flesh tells them to do. Why do you did you why did you react that way? Your body react told you to react that way. Your flesh told you to react that way. Or you're, if you're, in a, you're a young man, you're in a campus situation, you're, you're a young person, you're in a, a corporate life situation, your friends react to that way. So that is why, that's why you also react that way. Peer pressure. So you're, we are either responding to peer pressure or fleshly pleasure, pressure, peer pressure, fleshly pressure, or even sometimes we, instead of, us receiving counsel from God, we receive counsel from the devil and we obey those counsels from the devil, straight from the devil. How do I know some counsels are straight from the devil? Anything contrary to the written word of God is straight from the devil. So in this time of turmoil, you meet as a young man, you meet a young lady and she's not a believer and you think that this girl is God sent into your life, but she's not a believer and you want to fall in love with her because you want to cover up all the pain. You want to cope with all the pain that you're in. That counsel that that you should fall in love with that, that girl is from straight from the devil. It's a devilish counsel because it's contradicting the direct word of God. First Samuel, First Corinthians seven thirty nine. A believer marries only a believer. It's the biblical command. So anything contradicting the written word of God, that counsel or that idea comes straight from the devil. Don't obey that idea. To, in order to, just to cope with the pain. So direction from the Lord, that's the second step, drenching in, yes, in God's presence. And let's quickly go, uh, how do you respond to these situations of suffering after suffering? David running away from Absalom, David's uh, rented house burnt down, David's family, wife and kids taken off. How do you respond in such a situation? Okay, the Bible says in uh, God's response, verse 8, second part, eternal one, go after them, you will catch them, you will eventually rescue your families. So God says, go after them, pursue them. And verse 9 and 10, verse 7 and 30. So David set out with his 600 men. By now, David had 600 men. He was on the run, but God gave him people around him. He had charisma as well. God gave him charisma. 600 men were around him. Um, you would find that there are different numbers reported, but it's a growing number. Even though he was on the run, God gave him people around. So, so David set out with the 600 men and they came to the Wadi of Bezor, a dry creek where they had left behind, where they left behind 200 men who were too exhausted to continue the pursuit. So they, they are to his journey trying to pursue these raiders and 200 men were too tired. So they left them behind so now they are 400 men. So they are pursuing. That's the third thing you need to do. Dare to dare to attack your enemy. There's an enemy who caused that problem to you. Uh, maybe if you are having a health crisis, that health crisis was perhaps caused by the enemy called indiscipline. Refusal to walk. Refusal to avoid junk food. Refusal to... Uh, cut down sugar, refusal to, you know, it rank indiscipline. Attack that enemy. Dare to attack the enemy that cost you this, this, this situation. Of course, when it comes to enemies of the gospel, and I'm talking about the Manipur situation and situations similar to that, we don't go and physically punch the enemies of the gospel. We, we, but we still attack them. We heap burning coals on their head. As we come to the New Testament, I understand as we read Romans and as we write, read the writings of Paul, we burn, we heap burning coals on them. How do we heap burning coals on them? When you heap burning coals on somebody, they, you know, they, they feel it's also an attack. How? By showing them love, by giving them the gospel. Like what David Wilkerson said, you know, when he was preaching in the underworld of New York City. And when Nikki Cruz, the gangster, said, I'm going to cut you to so many pieces. You come to this gangster alley to share the gospel. David Wilkerson, this New York 
New York pastor who came to preach the gospel in the underworld. He said, I'm going to, that gangster, Nikki Cruz, told him, I'm going to cut you to pieces. And David Wilkerson said, you can cut me to a hundred pieces or how, how many other pieces. Each piece will tell you Jesus loves you. And I love you. And Jesus came to die for you on the cross. So sharing the gospel, because gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We know that from the book of Romans. That's also an attack. So dare me. Whatever, whatever be the enemy that causes that attack on you. It could be your wife. Show her love. Love. Go beyond the light. Go beyond the call of duty. Go beyond everything. Show her love. That's like heaping burning coals on her. Or your rebellious teenage son. Show him love. The, the love that the Bible recommends. That is warfare. Dare. Attack. Drench. Receive direction. Dare. And then the open country, to cut a long story short, if you read from read verse 11 onwards, David meets an abandoned young man, abandoned by the same guys who attacked his rented house, rented house or rented temporary stay and carried his wife and kids. David met those guys, a, a, a man abandoned by that, the team of raiders, the Amalekites. A young man, an Egyptian, and David shows love to him, concern for him, because he and he says, uh, if you keep reading uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 13, I'm a young man of Egypt who served an Amalekite, but my master left me behind three days ago because I was sick. 1 Samuel 30, 13. He was abandoned because he was sick. Now, David himself has got so much of trouble, trouble after trouble, but he's in a place he is wanting to help another man who was abandoned. So that's the, that's the fourth response. Not only drench, not only receive direction, but not only dare uh, and to attack the enemy. Fourth, do. What is do? Do the, obey the greatest command. What is the greatest command? To love God and to love people. So in our pain, we forget to obey the commands of God. In our pain, especially the command of God, it says that we must... No matter what our mood is, no matter what our situation is, if we can help someone, we must help someone. We must, if, if that's possible, we must. Here was David helping a young man who was abandoned by the army that attacked his family and attacked uh, and took away his, uh, took away, attacked his residence and took away his family. He was obeying. He was doing the great, the greatest command without even hearing of the greatest command, perhaps, from the mouth of Jesus. The son of David is obeying the, 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 David was obeying the command of the son of David, Jesus, whose greatest command was love God, love people. That's why I spend time with the word of God. Read the word of God. Even this series that I have, chosen chapter two, covering counterfeit counter issues. I encourage people to get into the word of God. This is a chapter study, first Samuel 30 study. Okay, so get into the word of God. And we have, as a ministry, we have tried to our best to get people into the word of God, uh, the best way possible using creative means. And the Kahoot quiz, which we had, uh, the last Kahoot quiz was in actually first, uh, this life of David. And, and this message comes from my own study of uh, the life of David and my preparation and my what the Holy Spirit has been sharing with me. Uh, we have had a number of Kahot Bible quizzes where people all over India and beyond have, have, have dived into God's word. And then we have, when we were in Hyderabad, we took, by, took a small group of people, 10 people, 5 people, 15 people, 20 people. The biggest crowd is around 25 uh, maximum, uh, you know, from from Genesis to Revelation, not following that order, all the 66 books, and then uh, another 20 studies we did on all the doctrines of the Bible, helping people dive into God's word. Because unless we dive into God's word, we will not do what God wants us to do, which is a, which is a priority for us as believers. Doing what God tells us to do will not save us. But having been saved in our, in our pursuit for ongoing holiness, we do what he calls us to do. Here was David, in spite of his pain, he was not focused on his own pain. He had the eyes to see somebody else's pain, this, this pain of this young man abandoned by this army. He didn't know. Only conversation with him let him understand. 
Sometimes we don't even have want to have conversations with people whom we suspect have pain because we have pain ourselves. We don't want to even open a WhatsApp chat with someone. We know that person is in pain, but we don't even want to have a WhatsApp chat with that person because he, we think that person will transfer his pain to me and I'm already in pain. I don't want that, all this headache. I don't want this headache. I'm already in pain. Why should I chat, WhatsApp chat with that person and receive that person's pain on for me? But you know that information that he would belong to the army, he didn't know, David didn't know, but God, that's God's coincidence. God arranged coincidence. Like the coincidence, like Ruth went to a particular field and that field happened to be Boaz's field and Boaz would fall in love with her and Boaz would marry Ruth and then God would bless that family. Ruth, the widow, received a wonderful wow turn in her life. It, she happened to go to a field. So David happened to see a man in pain. He initiated a conversation and that conversation led him closer to his enemy and led was a major step in him receiving back all that he lost. So you're in that hospital. Don't be focused on your own pain. Look at the person left. Look at the person right. I was in the emergency department in CMC hospital. I was trying to take care of my father-in-law who had a giddiness and I had rushed him. Uh, along with my mother-in-law, who's also not very well. So the two of us in the hospital, in CMC Velo. But then when I was taking care of him, I noticed a young woman who was surrounded by boys and girls and uh, her tag and the tag of people around suggested to me that they, uh, they were actually students of the famous VIT university in the same city, uh, Velo. And before that day was done and it was few hours at least in that emergency department or uh, whatever that's called and uh, uh, you know I would give a gospel tract to that girl and and her friends uh, our Doniwala gospel tract what was I thinking I was not focused on our own family emergency I was not focused on our own family emergency but I wanted to see if any other family also had emergency of course I didn't have, couldn't do much, but at least this I could do. At least this I could do. So when you're in pain, don't just focus on your pain. Look at others who perhaps have pain lesser than you, equal to you or more to you, doesn't matter. Try to help them. That is obeying the greatest command, doing the greatest command, love God, love people. Okay, and then uh, verse 15, 1 Samuel chapter 30 verse 15, can you, David told this young man, can you lead me to this wedding party? And this Egyptian helps him. And then there was another battle uh, and David uh, took back all that he lost, to cut the long story short. David verse 18, so David recovered everything that had been taken. First Samuel 30 verse 18. So again, fight. I told you, we need to fight we need to fight. It's a spiritual fight against all the forces that are being used to take away our help, our, our whatever. And so, so much so that we are now in a situation where we think we have lost all and we are crying till we don't have any more strength to cry. So David, that, uh, that, that battle was done. I already mentioned that. So that battle is ongoing. In fact, it's an ongoing battle. Even against flesh, First Peter 2.11 says, we have a daily battle against sexual lusts that wages war against us. Daily battle. First, Sam, First Peter 2.11. 1 Peter 2.11. Daily battle. Maybe you are in a situation because you followed your urges, sexual urges, and then you are in a situation right now, an embarrassing situation maybe, but you wage war against it. First, Peter 2.11, we wage war, repent of that sin, receive Jesus' forgiveness, and continually wage war against it. Don't give up. First Peter 2.11. So David waged war against the Amalekites. God helped him recover everything that had been taken. But the interesting thing is, um, David could have done something which he did not do. He could have also uh, praised God in the situation. Why should he praise God? Because as this study Bible says, and this is one of the best study Bibles I have, the Spirit of Reformation Study Bible. Uh, it's an old study Bible which I got over two decades ago. Uh, my uncle, Pastor Nyana Segrin, got this for me in a sale, 90% off at that time. So I just paid a few hundreds to buy this, get this Bible. 
which is a treasure. And I would not have known this truth if I am not if I was not reading this study Bible, Spirit of Reformation study Bible. Uh, it says uh, in verse two, First Samuel chapter thirty, verse two, that the Amalekites spared the the wives of David and the kids of David. But that was very different from what David himself did as a raider. You know, the, he almost acted like a raider when he was on the run because he needed food. He needed food for his family, his uh, for the team around him. So he also would raid. Uh, he was a the, he was a king of Israel. I, I mean, uh, he was a man anointed to be king of Israel. But he was he was because he was on the run. He was also a raider, and he had some practices. Um, First uh, Samuel twenty seven and verse uh, verse nine says. First Samuel twenty seven and verse nine says. First Samuel twenty seven verse nine. Whenever David attacked an area, he did not leave a man or woman alive but took sheep and cattle and donkeys and camels and clothes. Then he, so that this also has been David's practice. So Amalekites were not as bad as David. The Amalekites spared the life of David's family. They took David's wives and they took his children, but David himself in 1 Samuel chapter 27 and verse 9, when he attacked an area, did not leave a man or woman alive. So David should have said, Lord, you were merciful to me. I, as a raider, attacked and killed people. But these Amalekites were actually not as bad as me. When you're in suffering, you often think the whole world is bad and you alone are good and you are receiving unjust suffering. But rather, just keep your focus on God. God is good. God is gracious. So God was gracious to David even during this time of acute pain, where a pain where he's crying without strength to cry. He's in a situation where he's weeping when he had no strength to weep, as we read in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse, verse 4. But actually, the fact of the matter is, God was gracious to him. The Amalekites did not do to him what he had been doing to so many people. So never lose sight of the grace of God. Drench yourself, not only in the presence of God, but drench yourself in the grace of God, in the grace of God. And then David returns, to cut the long story short, the 200 people whom we left behind, who, because we are there tired, there's a fight between the 200 who stayed behind and 400 who went with David. And David uh, says, uh, basically David says, in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 24, why should anyone agree with you about this matter? The share of the one who fights is the same as a share of the one who looks after the supplies. We will share equally. And this was made as a law. And then David says in verse 23, 1 Samuel 30 verse 23, this is not how we are going to treat what the eternal one has returned to us. So who went, who did the battle? David and his team of 400. But David did not see the victory as coming from their experience. So if India wins the World Test Championship today, today is the final day, India need another 280 to win. Kohli and, and uh, Jigir Rahane are, the, are batting. And if India win, I would not credit Kohli or Jigir Rahane. I would credit God because I've been praying. I've been praying for Kohli's salvation. Rahane's salvation, but I'm also praying for India's win. So I would credit my God, the living God. So when you have a victory, when, when God re restores your health, when God restores your family, when God restores all that you have lost, give him the glory. The eternal one, 1 Samuel 30 verse 23, the eternal one has returned all this to us. And he returned everything. He returned everything. He got back everything. And David says, the, the share of the one who fights is the same as the share of the one who looks at the supply. I want to make an application here in the, in the context of missions. Uh, there are missionaries who go to the tough areas and work uh, in North India, in, among the tribals. And as a, a, me, as someone who works among the Google generation, the forefront of that ministry, there are people behind supporting us, finances, via finances, via prayer. God says, on the final day, your reward, the people who support, people who 
finance, people who pray and finance and offer financial support, both the rewards, people who stayed behind to support morally and with finances and the people who went to the war front, the reward for both will be the same. I understand this from a keen study of 1 Samuel chapter 30. So be encouraged. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew 10, 42, even if you give a cup of cold water to one of the least disciples of Jesus, you will not lose your reward. Matthew 10, 42. And then uh, the Bible also says in the book of Hebrews 6, 10, God will not forget your good work as you, as you help the saints. Uh, the context there is saints who were undergoing persecution or under pressure because of uh, what was happening there. The saints were under great pressure to return back to the Jewish faith and they, they didn't return, they were uh, under persecution. So God is not going to, God is going to reward you for financially supporting ministries that are in the forefront of doing God's work, God's way as it's written in the Bible. So when you do that, God's going to reward you and God is going to, God does will not forget what you have done. Hebrews 6.10 and Matthew 10.42. So I want to encourage you with that. But then there's a debate and uh, I've been sharing this message with my own family as well. And my daughter who was 15 years old was really disturbed that David had wives, plural. And then we know that David had a number of wives. I've, elsewhere, I've done a study on all those things. There's a study on polygamy, Duke Gerard's polygamy. If you if you search, I've done another chosen chapter two covering contemporary issue on another uh, passage uh, from Samuel, maybe 2 Samuel 3 or 2 Samuel 5, I think, 2 Samuel 5. Uh, 2 Samuel 3, 2 Samuel 4, 2 Samuel 5, uh, you could find that Bible study. So I'm not going to go, go deep into it. But here, just because David had wives, it is not a license for us to have more than one wife. Um, in fact, God made it very clear. He created one Adam for one Eve. And if David or anybody else took more than one wife, they were disobeying the pattern set by God. But having married one, having married one one person, more than one person, God, God, it, it looked, it appears clearly appears that God wanted them to take care of the extra woman they married. So they cannot marry one more person, have sexual relations with that person, give a child to that person, and then send them away. Because suddenly you remember that Bible says one man has to have one wife. Adam had uh, one wife, which was given by God. Uh, was given by God. Eve was given by God. Not God did not give him many Eves. So I, suddenly I wake up one morning after sex with my second wife. And after she becomes pregnant, after she starts vomiting, then I, I send off the second wife. So because of that uh, concern that God had for the second wife who, have been, who, who was unlawfully married, God, at, at times it appears that God is okay with polygamy. He's not okay with polygamy. He's only saying, uh, for example, in 1 Samuel 12, you'd find, I gave you wives, you know, the, the place with God says, I gave you wives. The, the understanding is, you pattern is clear. God gave one Adam for one Eve, but you with your hardness of heart married more than one, one person and you already had more than one person and I, um, or more than one wife and I expect you to be to, to, to be satisfied with the wives that you already have. You didn't, I didn't ask ask you to marry the second or third or fourth or fifth. But having married these women, you need to be content with these women and you need to take care of these women. So he's not, God is not recommending that they marry more fresh women. Absolutely not. And Deuteronomy 17, 17 and Deuteronomy 17, 17 to 19, Deuteronomy 17, 17 to 19, if you read, a king of Israel should not multiply wives. So what David did was a clear violation of the law, but in the Old Testament, not in every place you would find that when a child of God violates God's word, you would find a, a, a line that what they did displeased the Lord. You would not find that. But we need to understand that from the whole council of scripture. When we come to the end of the, when you come to the epistles, it's very clear. The elder of the church must be husband of one wife, which means if you are a polygamist and you enter the church and you know you can't be in leadership, 
So, and I, I, there's a false teacher who operates from an area called Ponmar, and uh, I, I, I remember hearing him talk about this, uh, and as if to say that, uh, you know, he, he sort of uses this uh, uh, to say that uh, uh, then some people would say, I don't want to be an elder, so I'll be a normal believer. So as a normal believer, I'm going to marry as many women as I want. No, that's, uh, so he sort of gets into this kind of conversation to, to, to discourage people from going into the word of God as the final court of appeal for all matters of belief and behavior. So he says, if you will take the word of God as the final court of appeal for all matters of belief and behavior, then you should be also practicing polygamy. I defer. The word of God continues to be the final court of appeal for all matters of belief and behavior when it's interpreted correctly the way we must interpret it. How do we interpret it? We don't make doctrines based on one or two verses, uh, one or two passages, but we take the whole counsel of God, the whole counsel of God with regard to the number of wives you can have or the number of husbands you can have, you know, uh, is very conclusive. A, a, a elder of the church should be husband of one wife. It's repeated there so many times times in the New Testament, in the epistles, and Jesus himself, when he was talking about marriage, said, a man will leave his father and be joined to his wife, singular, not plural. So that is the conclusion of the matter. So the conclusion of the matter matter uh, is important. So the Bible continues to remain the final code of appeal for all matters of belief and behavior uh, when it is interpreted correctly. So our focus should be to interpret the Bible correctly. So David had wives and God gave them back the wives. Why God wanted, God had concern for the extra women who are married by these lustful men and um, men who had other reasons to marry more than one woman. Um, kings especially, they wanted to expand their territories. They were not trusting God to give them more land, more territory, but they were trying to use the worldly ways of expanding territories because those days, the best way to expand your territory was to marry the daughter of a king who was far away. And, and that territory, the, that king's territory also belongs to, starts to belong to you when you marry his daughter. So when they were, they were copying the world, they were obeying the lust obey, uh, to marry one more women. But God wanted to protect the women who, are, who came into families like that. So that's why he did not tell them to abandon the women, even in the New Testament. If by, if, if by a sinful act you're married to more than one person, you need to take care of that woman the same way you take care of your first wife. And that, that's, 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 that was God's plan. And so you can't be in church leadership. But God's plan is that everyone should be in, in church leadership. The, the Bible teaches priesthood of all believers, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. So uh, don't uh, mock uh, the word of God by saying, if... If uh, you say the elder should marry only one wife, uh, you can say that uh, I don't want to be an elder or even give room for arguments like that and weaken people's trust in the written word of God as the final code of appeal for all matters of belief and behavior. You would answer to God on the day of judgment. So that's my brief study of 1 Samuel chapter 30. And I've not done a verse by verse study. But even as you're weeping without any strength anymore to weep, may God add encouragement to you through this Bible study. Shall we pray? Lord, there are people who are listening to this broadcast. They are weeping so much. They have no more strength to weep. But in this situation, I pray that they will drench yourself in God's presence. That they will remember that you are a gracious God, Lord, to them. That you are gracious to them, Lord that they will receive direction from you, that they will do what you have written in the word of God, oh Lord. And I pray that, 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 that they will dare to attack the enemy. They will engage in spiritual battle. And Lord, we thank you for all the other applications that those who support missionary work receive the same reward as those who do missionary work. And even G4 Mission, Lord, I'm able to do a broadcast like this in our new base in Sembarkam. Lord, I'm able to do a broadcast like this on the Sunday morning, record this over Zoom and upload it on YouTube because of the precious financial support of so many of our partners, Lord, who live in different parts of India. 
We pray that you'll bless them, Lord. We thank you for this time. We pray that you will, Lord, that you will help them recover all. And we know, Lord, there are times when on this side of eternity, we will not recover everything. We will not, we will not get back all that we have lost. But on the other side of eternity, as we understand from Romans 8.23, Lord, we have a body that is breaking down and we are waiting for redemption. Romans 8, 23. There are things that can will be only given back to us. Maybe our, with, maybe our health. We can pray for healing, but healing happens because of... Healing may happen. Healing may not happen. And sometimes we... And many times, and sometimes, and many times, we have to wait for the total redemption of our bodies, as Romans 8, 8 23 says. Lord, even if we don't get back all that we have lost on this side of eternity, on the other side of eternity, as we understand from Romans 8, 23, as we understand from the last few chapters of the New Testament, Revelation 21, Revelation 22, Lord, David wept till he had no more strength to weep. As long as we are on this side of eternity, we will weep. There will be occasions for us to weep, but when we go to the other side of eternity, as we understand from Revelation 21, We'll, and verse 4, Revelation 21 and verse 4. First Samuel 30, verse 4, David wept till he had no strength to weep. Revelation 21 and verse 4, Lord, we will go to a place where there's no more weeping, which means till that day or till the return of Jesus, who comes to take us to that place, heaven, Jesus who returns to take us to that place, there could be weeping. There could be occasions for weeping. Help us to strengthen ourselves. Help us to be suffering ready believers. Help us to be suffering ready believers. Thank you for speaking to us. In Jesus Christ, my prayer. Amen. Thank you for joining us in this broadcast. And I'm so encouraged. Uh, please write to us. If this broadcast has helped you, write to us. My WhatsApp number is uh, 888-6040-605. Leave me a WhatsApp message. 888-6040-605. 91 is the country code. I live in India. May God bless you uh, uh, over and above what you do for the, your church, local church. Uh, uh, please continue to support your local church. That's what I mean. Uh, other ministries that you might support, biblical ministries, Bible ministries that don't violate the written word of God. Please continue to support them. There are many uh, out there. Uh, so please continue to support those ministries that you're already supporting. Over and above that, if God should stir your heart to send us an offering, please reach out to us by the same WhatsApp number. God bless you, and I will see you again on another broadcast like this.